Hello! This lecture is titled Staying Abreast of Breast Pathology, brought to you by me, your friendly neighborhood pathologist, Dr. Jennifer Gordetsky. We are going to start off with the normal histology of the breast and then move on to the AB normal pathology, which includes benign and malignant lesions. I would like to turn your attention to the picture here of Robin's pathology, chapter 23, which covers uh, the pathology of the breast. This is our uh, pathology book of choice for learning about basic uh, breast pathology. Now, if uh, big Robin's is uh, too much for you, you can also go ahead and look at baby Robin's, which is like big Robin's, but just smaller. This is the normal breast anatomy. You can see here we have the nipple, and then that leads to these large ducts, which eventually go into these terminal ductal lobular units that you see here. Now, around these terminal ductal lobular units, you have fat, and then resting beneath the fat, are the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscles, as well as ribs and the intercostal muscles. Here we have the uh, histology of the lactiferous duct of the nipple. You can see that on the surface, we have squamous epithelium, and that squamous epithelium actually dives down into the orifice of the lactiferous ducts for uh, a short while. Now, the basement membrane of the ducts is continuous with the basement membrane of the skin. So you can follow this line here. The basement membrane, remember, uh, is what separates our epithelium from the connective tissue underneath, right? So which separates our skin from the dermis. And you can see that it is all contiguous moving down here. Now this stuff here that you can see with the uh, white fancy arrows is a bunch of keratin debris. And that can happen and be present in the orifices of the non-lactating breast. If milk was flowing through there, then that would clear out the keratin plugs. The terminal ductal lobular units that you see here are kind of a big deal. And this is where the action happens, right? So milk is produced by the luminal cells, and then the myoepithelial cells basically help uh, to contract and expel that milk into the duct system. And this is kind of like a tree. So you have uh, the terminal ductal lobular units here at the end of this uh, branch, and then the milk will go into these ducts, and that eventually goes to the nipple. This is the histology of the terminal ductal lobular unit. We have this large duct here. As you can see, it is terminating into this lobular unit, right? Terminal ductal lobular unit. And the terminal ductal lobular unit has these little circles here. And these are called asini. And uh, as we discussed before, the benign ducts and lobules have a two-cell layer, the myoepithelial cells and the luminal cells. Now, this entire structure is very similar to uh, grapes. So the stem of the grape would be your uh, duct, which is terminating uh, into this lobular unit, and the little grapes would be asini. This is a closer histologic view of the different layers of the benign ducts and lobules. You can see the luminal cells here that are towards the lumen of the duct, as well as the myoepithelial cells which line the basement membrane. Now, what is an important concept here is that in cancer, myoepithelial cells are gone. So this is what cancer looks like invading through uh, the tissue, causing a desmoplastic reaction, and these glands do not have any myoepithelial cells.
breast epithelium is hormonally responsive, and therefore the histology of the breast is going to change as you go through the different phases of life. So when you start off in the prepubertal uh, histology, you notice that you only have large ducts, right? And you have this very dense stroma. As you move on to puberty, now you're getting your terminal ductal lobular units, and you're having the formation of asini, which again is the functional unit of the breast where the milk production is going to happen. Notice how dense the fibrous tissue is around these terminal ductal lobular units. And because this stroma is so dense, when you have uh, a radiographic image on mammography in the younger patients, you can see that it is very white because it is very, very dense. Now let us talk about the histologic changes that occur during pregnancy. Yes, pregnancy, that magical, special time of life when you learn to fear every single thing you will hear about in this course. Now, as you might expect, the changes during pregnancy can look quite scary. These are actually benign uh, terminal ductal lobular units here. So this little uh, gland has nuclei that are large and have prominent nucleoli, and as you can see, it, you it's very hard to see the myoepithelial cells. There's also brisk mitoses. And so just by looking at this image, one could be very scared and think that this is out to kill you and that it's malignant, but it's not. And one of the keys are these little vacuoles. So this kind of uh, little holes that are poking their way in the cytoplasm, see all those little spaces, right? So the, those kind of uh, secretory changes, those little holes, are the tip-off that this is actually just a lactating uh, breast and not malignant. The other tip-off is that notice our terminal ductal lobular units, see how I can draw little circles around them? Those are maintained. So even though they're growing and they're getting bigger so that they can produce milk, they're maintaining a normal architectural uh, appearance, and that's very important. So even though when you look really close, you get scared, you say, oh my gosh, I think that's gonna kill me, but then you take a step back, and on low power, you realize, oh no, it's not gonna kill me. It's just getting ready for a baby. Anyways, moving on. Now let us talk about the postmenopausal changes to the breast. So this image, which you have seen before, shows a terminal ductal lobular unit. Here are little asini, remember, lined by myoepithelial cells and luminal cells, and we have this dense fibrous connective tissue. But as I can tell you, now that I have reached my 40th year of life, that as one gets older, one tends to acquire more fat. So this is what the breast looks like in a postmenopausal woman. As you can see, we no longer have our terminal ductal lobular units. We basically just have the ducts and a minimal amount of stroma and then all this white stuff, which is a lot of fat. But the good news is that when you have lots of fat, that makes the breast more radiolucent, which means it's easier to be able to find cancer on mammography. So you got that going for you, which is nice. So the next inevitable question is really the question that all parents ask their children at some point in their lives, and that is, where do breast lesions come from? Well, as you can see here on this picture, the carcinoma actually comes from the luminal cells that line the asini, and our uh, things like squamous metaplasia of the lactiferous ducts and the large duct papillomas, that's going to be in your duct system, and then our fibroepithelial lesions such as fibroadenoma and phyloides tumor, as you can see, that actually comes from the intralobular stroma, which is the stroma that is just around the terminal ductal lobular unit. There are several conditions of the breast that are benign, but can mimic cancer, and acute mastitis is one of them. 
So acute mastitis is a bacterial infection that is not uncommon during breastfeeding. What happens is that there are fissures and cracks in the nipple that occur during breastfeeding, and bacteria can therefore get into the duct system and cause an infection. The breast is red, swollen, and painful. It also accompanies by a fever. Now, an uncomplicated case of acute mastitis can be treated with antibiotics with continuation of breastfeeding. However, complicated cases may uh, lead to an abscess, which require incision and drainage. Additionally, if you've had acute mastitis, this can result in fibrosis, which may later be confused as a mass. This is what acute mastitis looks like under the microscope. As you can see, the terminal ductal lobular units, which are here, there's one here, there's one here, they've been completely overrun by inflammatory cells. So all these little dots down there, those are inflammatory cells that are basically obliterating the terminal ductal lobular units, and all you have are a residual few asini that are left over. This is an extreme case of acute mastitis, which has led to an abscess. And as you can see, uh, all that is left here is maybe a duct or two, uh, some multinucleated uh, giant cells. These are basically histiocytes. And then many, many, many neutrophils, which is essentially pus. Duct ectasia is a very common condition. It uh, basically occurs with age as uh, the walls of the duct weaken and uh, fill with debris and they become uh, sort of expanded like a balloon and filled with um, histiocytes. Now, uh, sometimes this is not palpable, but other times it can mimic cancer. Now, there's no treatment necessary if you uh, biopsy this and you uh, realize that uh, it's benign. Um, sometimes uh, these can rupture. So as you imagine with duct ectasia, right, the ducts are blown up like a balloon as they fill with debris. Well, they can pop, and when that happens, they rupture, and uh, you have the macrophages that come in and try to clean up all the debris. And again, that's going to lead to um, fibrosis and inflammation. Fat necrosis is another mimicker of malignancy. Again, it's benign. This typically happens uh, with trauma. So something smashes into the breast, uh, and the fat cells die off, and the macrophages come in uh, to clean up the mess. So this is what it looks like on uh, low power. Um, you can see some residual uh, fat cells here, and, um, and then all of this in here where you're no longer seeing fat cells, you have macrophages coming in to eat up the debris. This is a higher magnification. Again, we have these multinucleated giant cells, which are uh, histiocytes, uh, again, that are coming in to, to eat up the debris here. We have more histiocytes. These are what we call foam cells. They're filled with lipids as they eat up the dead fat cells. Diabetic uh, mastopathy is also known as lymphocytic mastopathy. Again, this uh, can cause uh, firmness uh, to the breast, causing single or multiple hard palpable uh, densities or masses, uh, a nice mimicker of cancer. Um, what you see is just a lot of atrophic uh, ducts and lobules um, with a lot of lymphocytes surrounding them. So you can see all these lymphocytes surrounding the terminal ductal lobular units, lots of fibrosis, very commonly seen in um, diabetes as well as uh, other autoimmune diseases. This is a uh, closer view of the histology of lymphocytic mastopathy. Here are the residual uh, asini that are left, and you can see all these little lymphocytes that are surrounding uh, the terminal ductal lobular unit. Now let us move on to proliferative and non-proliferative lesions of the breast. 
And the most important thing is not to panic, because although uh, this looks pretty horrible, it's important to recognize that this is all maintaining its normal terminal ductal lobular units. So although you look at this and you think, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, there are too many glands, ah, it's important to remember that this is still benign. Okay, this is not so bad. So we'll just go through this uh, in a little more detail. Now, uh, proliferative and non-proliferative uh, lesions of the breast, depending on what type you have, give you a different relative risk of developing cancer. So that's an important concept. So when you look up here at our fibrocystic change, which is very common, this is a non-proliferative uh, breast changes, and notice the relative uh, risk of a developing cancer is relatively low, so that's good. Now, when you move to proliferative disease, so now we're proliferating, but there's no atypia, well, that's not so bad, maybe one and a half uh, to two times the risk, right? Uh, but once you have proliferative disease with atypia, okay, these are your atypical ductal and lobular hyperplasias, suddenly your risk is four to five times. And when you have carcinoma in situ, which is literally cancer that has not invaded yet, you can see that uh, your risk of developing a cancer is now quite high. Fibrocystic change um, or non-proliferative changes of the breast are incredibly common. Uh, in fact, over half of women are thought to have fibrocystic change. And this is really cyclical breast pain that comes along uh, with uh, your menstrual cycle. These changes tend to be diffuse and bilateral, causing a lumpy, bumpy uh, kind of uh, feeling to the breast. And you can see here that those changes include fibrosis, apocrine metaplasia, some cysts. You can have microcalcifications, uh, inflammation, and adenosis. But notice that there's really no increased cancer risk here, right? You remember from the other slide where the relative risk was one. This is a gross uh, photograph of um, the breast with uh, some fibrocystic change. And what you see here is what we call a blue dome cyst. And this is basically just a dilated duct with some fibrosis around it, which is this uh, white, firm, uh, fibrousy tissue. So this is a type of fibrocystic change. Uh, here we have another example. This is a uh, simple cyst that has ruptured, and so it contains uh, some debris and blood. And again, this would be considered a simple cyst, and this would be part of fibrocystic change or non-proliferative uh, changes to the breast. Here is the histology of some fibrocystic changes. So you can see here, uh, this is a gigantic dilated uh, duct, so it's formed a cyst. And here we have the epithelial lining, which has myoepithelial cells and luminal cells. Remember those guys? So here they are uh, along this dilated duct. We have other little dilated ducts here. And then you can see all this pink stuff. That's all fibrosis. So again, this is all uh, fibrocystic change or non-proliferative uh, lesion of the breast. Now let us talk about apocrine metaplasia, my personal favorite type of fibrocystic change because it's um, really pink and really pretty. So you can see these uh, cells here that are uh, lining these uh, dilated um, ducts and uh, you still have uh, myoepithelial cells. You can see them here as well as luminal cells. But notice that you have all this really beautiful, uh, abundant, granular eosinophilic cytoplasm uh, and that's what gives it its pink look. Now, sometimes uh, this can be associated with microcalcifications. And normally, uh, we think about these bad boys being associated with ductal carcinoma in situ. But you can also have microcalcifications associated with fibrocystic change, which is benign. Um, now, fun fact, when I was in res residency, uh, I actually participated in a breast cancer run with a bunch of my uh, fellow pathology residents, and we wore pink shirts. And what was our team name? That's right, the apocrine metaplasias. Awesome. 
Okay, adenosis is another type of fibrocystic change, and again, that we talked about, a non-proliferative one. Uh, and basically, if we're thinking about grapes, right? So we have uh, grapes, and uh, the grapes are on the stem. So this would basically be too many grapes, right? So too many acini uh, per lobule. So you can see here, so that we're maintaining our terminal ductal lobular unit, but you can see that there's just way too many acini, way too many grapes. And so that is adenosis. But again, adenosis in of itself is benign and does not give any increased risk of malignancy in the person's lifetime. Now, epithelial hyperplasia without atypia, this is our first type of proliferative uh, change of the breast. And again, now we have a one and a half to two times increased risk of breast cancer. Now, check this out. You can see the histology. This, uh, these cells are proliferating. They're filling up the uh, inside of our um, acinar structure, right? Now, the way that um, you can tell that this is actually not a carcinoma in situ is because the nuclei are kind of all over the place. Uh, they're different sizes and shapes. You get these little slit-like spaces on the outside. So this lesion still has uh, myoepithelial cells. It still has luminal cells. It's just that the luminal cells are proliferating. Now, it's a good thing that uh, they're all different, right? Because uh, that means it's not a clonal process. It's not just a single cell that's proliferating. It's lots of different cells that are proliferating. And you can see that in the diagram here. So there are red cells and yellow cells and green cells and blue cells. And, um, and they're all proliferating, uh, and so that's good. That's a clonal process, and so that means it's not uh, cancer. Uh, this is just a, a more high power view showing some of the um, slit like spaces that get formed with this kind of um, epithelial hyperplasia, which is also known as usual ductal hyperplasia, by the way, usual ductal hyperplasia. Um, and you can just see how the, the nuclei are kind of uh, spindled, they're overlapping, they're different sizes and shapes. And so that's, that's good. That shows that this is a non clonal uh, proliferative process. And again, no atypia. This is what sclerosing adenosis looks like, which is literally adenosis, which again was, right, too many grapes, meaning there are too many acinar structures, uh, plus sclerosis, okay? Um, and this is actually uh, very commonly seen in a screening mammogram, and it, and it can be uh, mistaken for cancer on imaging. Um, again, it's important to recognize that although this looks evil, it is uh, still maintaining the lobular, uh, terminal ductal lobular unit uh, shape, right? So cancer tends to, to spread out in all kinds of directions. It doesn't maintain this nice regular uh, shape. So yes, we have too many grapes here, and there's fibrosis, which is causing it to look a little sclerotic, but it's still benign. This is what sclerosing adenosis looks like close up. And you can see just tons and tons and tons of acini. And basically, all the fibrosis around these acini are causing them to get squished. And, uh, and the combination of too many grapes plus squishing of the grapes um, can make uh, a very dense, uh, compa compact uh, lesion, which uh, then on imaging uh, can be mistaken for cancer, but sclerosing adenosis is, again, uh, it's benign. Complex sclerosing lesions, which are also known as radial scars, can also uh, mimic cancer on a mammography. Uh, and actually, uh, even grossly, uh, they can look like uh, a lot like cancer. Why? Because you have this like dense fibrosis, and it looks like it's radiating uh, out, uh, which kind of makes it look like it's sort of this invasive lesion. Uh, but as we'll look at it uh, under the microscope, and you'll see that it's actually benign. Okay, so as promised, here we are looking at it under the microscope. And basically, uh, you can see that this uh, complex sclerosing lesion or radial scar is basically just um, fibrocystic changes with a lot of sclerosis, right? So you have, see all this pink stuff here? You have all this fibrosis, and that's what's actually causing your scar uh, formation, right? You can see how it's making this kind of like um, 
uh, like fireworks kind of appearance. And then we also have our dilated ducts like we see in fibrocystic change. Um, here we have a little bit of adenosis, right? Too many grapes. Um, and so um, this, uh, this is, again, just a, a bunch of fibrocystic changes uh, and radial scar, uh, and um, it, it, it's benign. Now, um, one could say that it looks like a firework, or one could say that it looks like the Death Star exploding um, as viewed from Endor, both perfectly um, good analogies. Introductal papilloma um, is basically just an epithelial proliferation that has grown into uh, one of the large ducts, um, as you can see here, and that can actually cause the duct to get clogged. Um, Here's what it looks like under the microscope. So this is the duct that is hugely dilated. And then you can see uh, this sort of papillary uh, proliferation of cells that are growing into the duct. Now again, this is going to have um, myoepithelial and luminal cells, um, and uh, it's a benign lesion. This is a closer view uh, or higher magnification of an introductal papilloma. And you can see you have these um, very nice uh, papillary structures, right? So they make little circles, and you have fibrovascular cores and little uh, the cells that are lining those fibrovascular cores. And so these are little um, papillae. Now, um, introductal papilloma in of itself is benign, right? A and you can see that these nuclei are um, just similar to the usual ductal hyperplasia. Um, the nuclei are kind of slender and they're overlapping and, and they, uh, there is no atypia. Uh, however, um, you actually can have introductal papillomas that get involved by ductal carcinoma in situ or ADH, but that's a little bit more um, complex <laughs> of a thought process. So um, for now, think about introductal papillomas as sort of this benign uh, growth that uh, can just uh, plug up a duct. Gynecomastia is enlargement of the male breast. Uh, it can be uh, unilateral or bilateral. Um, it's typically just the uh, enlargement of the tissue in the subareolar region. And uh, all you see under the microscope is basically just this really dense um, fibrosis. And, and then you have um, uh, just some uh, epithelial hyperplasia. But what's interesting is you notice that there's these are just the terminal ducts. There's actually there's no lobules, like the lobules would be out here, and you can see that those are all missing because this, again, is a, a male breast. Um, and there's a lot of things that can cause gynecomastia, uh, including, uh, you know, exogenous estrogens and uh, androgens, as well as uh, some other um, drugs uh, such as, you know, um, alcohol um, and steroids. Okay, now let's move on to atypical ductal hyperplasia. Um, now, we're starting to see atypia here, um, but it's not quite at uh, carcinoma in situ. And I'm going to start off right now by saying this is a very subjective uh, lesion, okay? So um, s there are many pathologists who argue uh, at conferences all the time and other places uh, about what when does atypical ductal hyperplasia become uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. So uh, literally it has like some of the features of carcinoma in situ, but not all of the features. So here you see, first of all, um, we still have our myoepithelial cells, right? So it's still in a nice little circular uh, unit here, this little asini. Um, now notice like some of these nuclei are looking okay, they're slender, they're overlapping, um, so that's clearly a polyclonal process, but then you look over here, uh, these nuclei are starting to look the same, they're starting to separate out, they're not overlapping anymore, and we're starting to get these kind of punched out, very rigid, uh, circular, cookie cutter um, spaces. Um, now, when you have atypical ductal hyperplasia on biopsy, uh, again, that means that your relative risk of, of cancer uh, is, is higher than, say, for uh, usual ductal hyperplasia or your non-proliferative fibrocystic changes, but it's not the same risk as having, um, like, ductal carcinoma in situ. This is atypical lobular hyperplasia. Um, honestly, we don't even 
really make these this diagnosis on biopsy anymore. Uh, most of the time, it's an uh, incidental finding, and literally, it looks exactly like what lobular carcinoma in situ would look like. It's just how many acid I are involved. Again, very subjective. Um, uh, and and I, uh, you know, at, at your level in med school, um, you don't really have to worry about it. Now, uh, what does it look like? You can see that um, these uh, nuclei look all the same, and they're basically just like piling in um, to the different little asini, and they're expanding them. So each one of these guys is an asinus, or asin. I have no idea how you say that, uh, and they're all being uh, expanded. So let us review real quick here. We have our usual ductal hyperplasia with spindled uh, nuclei that are kind of streaming. They're overlapping. You have these slit-like spaces kind of at the periphery, and that's, um, that's benign. Uh, now, this ha and again, this is a proliferative lesion without atypia. Here we have atypical ductal hyperplasia, which is a pr proliferative lesion with atypia, and you can see that the um, spaces here are starting to become more round and punched out like and very rigid um, and you're starting to get separation of the nuclei uh, they're starting to become a more um, clonal process now this has some of the features of uh, ductal carcinoma in situ which we'll look at in a little bit but it doesn't have all of them again it's subjective um, but just know that atypical ductal hyperplasia has uh, more of an increased risk of cancer than your usual ductal hyperplasia. Here we have um, just a little bit of a breast cancer epidemiology. Um, you have a one in eight lifetime risk of having breast cancer. That's for any woman in the United States um, with an increased uh, incidence um, around age 30. And uh, what's interesting is that the incidence is actually much higher in the United States and Europe compared to um, developing countries. And a lot of that has to do with estrogen, right? Um, so uh, you have delayed pregnancies and fewer pregnancies. And also a big one is uh, decreased breastfeeding. Now, um, what's interesting is that white women have the highest incidence of um, breast cancer. However, uh, if you look at African-American women, uh, the mortality is much, much higher. Um, and the, the thought is that um, this is probably due to two things. Uh, number one is biologically more aggressive uh, tumors in African-American women, um, and also, unfortunately, unequal access to health care. So this is a fun chart. You can actually uh, look at your risk factors and then see what your relative risk of developing cancer is. So, you know, things like alcohol intake and body mass index and, you know, when you started your period, when you go into menopause, you know, have you had children, you know, how old were you, when you had child, did you breastfeed and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so the, this one is the, the crazy one. Look at this. Uh, if you have a germline mutation, heterozygous for BRCA1 and age less than 40, right, um, compared to non-heterozygous BRCA1 and age less than 40, uh, 200 time relative risk. That's crazy. Familial breast cancers actually are um, the minority of breast cancers that we see in the United States. Um, the major genes uh, that we know of that are uh, implicated in familial breast cancer are tumor suppressor genes, right? So this is the, the two-hit uh, thought. So if you have an inherited uh, mutation, you've already taken um, one hit, and then any second hit, uh, you're, you have knocked out your tumor suppressor gene. Um, so the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 um, by, by and far account for the majority of hereditary breast cancers. But um, there's also other uh, um, familial uh, hereditary um, diseases that can uh, cause breast cancer, um, you know, especially like Cowden syndrome. Pete Seegers are associated with it. And, uh, but but um, less than 20% of women with a family history of breast, breast cancer will actually carry uh, any of these genes. This is uh, a little chart about the BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, mutations and um, the, you know, risk of developing uh, breast cancer um, as well as other associated um, cancers. Uh, so you can just uh, take time and 
read through this on your own. This is um, this is really good uh, fodder for the boards. They like to ask questions about this type of stuff. Uh, in terms of um, prognosis, once you are um, diagnosed with breast cancer, the most important prognostic factor in the absence of basically having widely metastatic disease is the status of your axillary lymph nodes. So when cancer spreads from the breast, it goes to the axillary lymph nodes uh, first. And so if you have uh, negative axillary lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis, that is very good. Um, other things that are prognostic factors um, include, you know, how advanced the disease is, um, again, at the time of removal, um, smaller size tumors do better, um, you know, is there distant metastases, um, inflammatory carcinoma, which uh, is also um, a clinical diagnosis, but um, basically when, uh, and we'll talk about it later, but it's basically cancer that has involved the lymphatics of the breast and causes uh, an, an inflammatory reaction of the skin. Um, other things uh, include a histologic subtype, um, the grade of the tumor, so how bad is the tumor um, itself, um, and then some molecular uh, subtype and receptor status. Um, Basically, will the tumor respond to horm hormonal treatment or, you know, will it respond to um, drugs like Herceptin? So this is um, what we've all been waiting for, carcinoma in situ, which is um, cancer that has not invaded yet. Notice the 8 to 10 time risk of breast cancer. Um, and this is a clonal uh, proliferation of epithelial cells, okay? Now, uh, there are two types, right? You have your ductal carcinoma in situ and your lobular carcinoma in situ. Um, and so um, you will see that the ductal carcinomas in situ have uh, many different patterns and our uh, lobular carcinoma in situ just looks like a very uh, monotonous population of uh, low-grade nuclei that are expanding uh, the acinar structure. So as I said, ductal carcinoma in situ has many um, different types of uh, morphologic patterns, like here we have some necrosis in the middle, this is more of a curviform pattern, <clears throat> this is a solid pattern, and we'll go into more detail about those. Um, but uh, it's also important to remember that um, ductal carcinoma in situ is many times associated with calcifications, and those can be um, detected on mammography. Um, very rarely does ductal carcinoma in situ cause actual symptoms. Most of the time it's picked up during um, screening mammography. Uh, and it can be graded as either low grade or high grade. Um, so here is uh, an example. So uh, over here we have very tiny little nuclei, really round, um, inconspicuous nucleoli. And then you can see here it's getting a little worse. The nucleoli are becoming a little bit more prominent. The cells are becoming a little bigger. And then here the nuclei are kind of odd shapes. They're very, very enlarged. And you have these macronucleoli. So this is just, a, and I, we would never ask you, of course, to grade. Um, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ as a medical student, but just be aware of how it's being graded. This is a solid type of ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, you can see all these horrible looking um, high grade nuclei that are expanding uh, all your little acinar structures. Um, and your differential diagnosis here is like maybe this is lobular carcinoma in situ, but um, the key is that the, the nuclei are actually much uglier than lobular carcinoma in situ. Um, and also, this would be positive for E. cadherin, uh, which is um, a connective uh, adhesion uh, protein that is lost in lobular carcinoma in situ. This is the uh, classic uh, image of ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, here we have microcalcifications. Um, being associated with this lesion, which again is um, how it's picked up on screening mammography. Notice it's um, still a nice little circle around it, and that's it's not infiltrative because it still has its myoepithelial cells. Um, and closer up, you can see this is a clonal process, right? All the nuclei look very similar. Instead of overlapping like we saw with the usual ductal um, uh, hyperplasia, right, which is benign. Um, so these nuclei are no longer overlapping. They all look very similar. They're spaced out from each other. And then we have um, these punched out rigid cookie cutter um, spaces. As you can see uh, here, they're making a cookie cutter shape. Wait, no, that's a heart. Hold on. Nope, that's not right. 
No. Uh, no. Yeah, that's Batman. That's just ridiculous. That's a squirrel. There we go. So as you can see here, uh, they're making this round uh, cookie cutter uh, punched out spaces, which is helpful in recognizing it as, as uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. This is another common uh, histology of uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. This is actually a high nuclear grade uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. You can see the nuclei are much larger. Um, you can see mitoses. Uh, and then in the center is, is necrosis, right? So, um, so this is uh, just a, a, a ductal carcinoma in situ with necrosis, which again is a, a common pattern of uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. Okay, moving on to lobular carcinoma in situ. So again, this is a neoplastic proliferation of epithelial cells. Now lobular carcinoma in situ looks really, really bland. Um, the nuclei are very low grade, very round. And um, the key here is anything that says lobular carcinoma, anything, uh, is going to have loss of EK adherin, which is this cohesion uh, molecule, okay? Um, Again, this is normally actually an incidental finding. You really can't see lobular carcinoma in situ um, on screening mammography. Most of the time it is not associated um, with calcifications. Now what's interesting is up to 50% of patients actually will have bilateral lobular carcinoma in situ when you do find it. Um, and uh, uh, patients um, who undergo mastectomy for lobular carcinoma in situ, the vast majority of them will have multifocal lesions. Um, and there is a risk for bilateral invasive uh, breast cancer uh, that is associated with this lesion. This is what lobular carcinoma in situ looks like under the microscope. So this is just to remind us of what our normal terminal ductal lobular unit looks like, right? So here's our main duct and it's leading into the TDLU. And then we have um, all of our little asini, right? Our little grapes on a stem. Um, so here, notice we still have our myoepithelial cells, right? And that's why um, it's maintaining its round uh, structure. But um, these cells in the middle um, have all uh, proliferated. And again, this is a clonal uh, neoplastic process. That's why they all look the same. They're all very low grade and kind of an inconspicuous nucleolus. And they basically just expand out um, the, uh, the acidus. Um, you can have signet cells uh, that uh, are lobular uh, carcinoma in situ cells. And um, you can also have, uh, see these little um, uh, vacuoles. That's also very common uh, with lobular carcinoma in situ. So uh, yeah, this is loss of e-cadherin. So this is what e-cadherin normally looks like. This is actually ductal, uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. So you can see that the e-cadherin on immunohistochemistry uh, is, is positive. And now here, which is lobular uh, carcinoma in situ as opposed to ductal carcinoma in situ, our lobular carcinoma in situ has lost uh, e-cadherin. Uh, so e-cads, we've lost e-cads. <laughs> yeah, stay with me. It's lobular. Okay, moving on to Paget's disease of the nipple. Um, so Paget's disease is basically um, a rare manif manifestation of breast cancer where um, you can see the uh, tumor cells have actually grown up the duct and involved the skin. Now remember how we said in one of the first slides that there that the duct system right is a contiguous right with the basement membrane of the nipple right, and so it's very easy for these cells to kind of migrate up uh, to the ducts. Uh, lactiferous ducts of the nipple, and then they can just spread into the skin here. And you can see that sometimes it'll cause um, ulceration um, or uh, crusting uh, around the nipple. And that's what Paget's disease would look like um, grossly. Uh, now, the prognosis is really it depends on how bad the cancer is uh, that this is associated with. Uh, this is a um, uh, uh, high magnification uh, view of what um, Paget's disease looks like. So here are our tumor cells. This is a uh, you know ductal uh, carcinoma that has uh, now spread uh, into the overlying skin. So here's your um, 
your squamous epithelium, right? Going, uh, this is your stratified uh, squamous and then going down here. Uh, notice that everything is still within the basement membrane. These cells are just uh, tracking uh, along the epidermis. Okay, moving on to invasive cancers of the breast. Basically, what I want you to remember is that there are two categories. There's invasive ductal carcinoma, and then there's everything else. So um, for our purposes, we're going to talk about invasive ductal carcinoma and invasive lobular carcinoma, but there's also more specialized histologic types um, that you probably don't need to know about right now at the medical school level. Um, so just think about there's invasive ductal carcinoma and then kind of everything else. There's also three major molecular subtypes which are important to know about. Those are your ER positive, HER2 negative, which are called the luminal breast cancers, and this is the most common uh, type of breast cancer. There's also the HER2 positive uh, breast cancers, which make up 20% of breast cancers. And then the most rare is what we call the triple negative, which are ER negative, PR negative, so estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and uh, HER2 negative uh, breast cancers. These are also called basal-like or triple negative breast cancers. This is a very busy uh, chart that basically just tells you about the three um, molecular subtype profiles, right? So here's our ER positive tumors, um, which actually can then be further divided into low proliferation, high proliferation. Uh, and then there's also our HER2 positives, right? These are going to be responding to Herceptin. And then there's our triple negatives, right? Uh, which do the worst because you think about this, right? These are not going to respond to hormonal therapy and you can't give them Herceptin. Um, the most important thing is just to uh, know um, like which ones are associated with, you know, the BRCA mutation. So you can see here's BRCA2 uh, in our ER positive for two negatives. Um, but here we have our younger women with BRCA1 mutation. Uh, also, uh, more African-American and Hispanic women uh, are uh, having our triple negative uh, breast cancers. Um, and you can see um, how well they respond to chemotherapy and their um, metastatic patterns uh, differ a little bit depending on the molecular subtypes. Invasive ductal carcinoma uh, is the most uh, common subtype, right? This makes up 75% of our breast cancers. And on mammography, it basically creates this little um, spiculated uh, lesion with irregular borders. This is what uh, invasive ductal carcinoma looks like grossly. Uh, you can see this uh, kind of tan, white, spiculated, irregular uh, lesion. These tend to be uh, very firm by palpation. And uh, sometimes grossly, you can see them invading uh, the dermis and causing uh, dimpling of the skin. Uh, this is um, an invasive uh, tumor uh, here. And as you can see, um, it's invading uh, the skin and actually causing retraction of the nipple. Um, here we see again, uh, here's this, this white irregular uh, lesion, uh, again, right underneath the skin. And uh, this one has caused ulceration of the skin. This is a very advanced uh, tumor. OK, so what does invasive ductal carcinoma look like under the microscope? Um, it's basically a bunch of invading donuts, right? So uh, you have lumens. These are glands, OK? And um, they can also uh, stream. Um, but the key feature of invasive ductal carcinoma uh, is that there are no myoepithelial cells uh, and that this is an in invasive infiltrating uh, tumor with a desmoplastic reaction. So the, the, the stroma is reacting to these cells as it invades through. Um, and there's really, you know, there's no terminal ductal lobular structure to this. This is, this is an invasive infiltrative disordered uh, mess. Um, but being able to see lumens uh, makes you know 100% that this is uh, ductal carcinoma and not lobular carcinoma. Okay, and here we can uh, put our donut really anywhere, and you can see it fits in, right? So um, here we have uh, a gland, right? These are invasive glands, and you see this donut fits right in with them. And we can also put our donut here, right? So here we go. More glands that are invading and uh, infiltrating through the stroma.
And now here, our donut doesn't really fit in. We're going to kick him out. Uh, and that's because um, as you get very high-grade tumors, um, they actually can uh, lose their glandular uh, formation. And so um, that's actually one of the ways we grade uh, our tumors under the microscope is by seeing how well they're forming glands. And so once they get to this level, where this is just sheets of cells with um, horrible uh, mitotic figures, I mean, God knows how many chromosomes are in that guy. Um, so by the time you, look at this dude. So anyways, by the time you get to this, this is very high grade uh, tumor with no gland formation. It's still invasive ductal carcinoma, um, it's just high grade. Um, this is uh, just a picture of um, metastatic breast cancer. Um, so this is bone here, and you can see this is all the tumor sitting within the bone, and uh, and then this is brain, and uh, here is some uh, cancer within the brain. So uh, this, remember the three Bs, uh, breast cancer goes to bone and brain. It's an easy way of remembering where it likes to metastasize to. Uh, this is another picture of it uh, in the bone. You can see here is a lesion here. Here's a lesion here, here's a lesion here, and uh, you can see the lesions here and here where the tumor has metastasized. Okay, let's move on to invasive lobular carcinoma, uh, which again, if you remember, there are the two types of uh, carcinoma. There's the ductal and then the everything else. Well, this is the most common of the everything else's. Okay, so this makes up 5 to 15% of breast cancers. Um, so the most of them present as an irregular breast mass, but um, some of them actually can be completely uh, invisible on mammography um, and can be really clinically and grossly difficult to detect. Now, the key with invasive lobular carcinoma is that, um, or really any lobular carcinoma, is again the loss of expression of e-cadherin. Okay, um, germline mutations. Uh, in patients that develop lobular carcinoma, those patients are also at increased risk for gastric signet ring cell carcinoma. These tumors tend to be multicentric and bilateral, um, and they tend to metastasize to slightly different places than the ductal carcinomas uh, do. This is what invasive lobular carcinoma looks like, basically um, just streaming uh, single nuclei, uh, very discohesive, again, because of loss of e-cadherin. And you can see that here we have lobular carcinoma in situ, here and here, which can be associated uh, with this lesion. Notice that you will not see any tubular formation, right? No donuts, and that's because this is not ductal carcinoma. All right, there's our lobular carcinoma in situ. Okay, this is just... Um, highlighting the targetoid um, or signet ring cell shapes that you can um, have with uh, with lobular carcinoma. Here we go. The nuclei kind of get pushed off uh, to one side, right? Um, and also, uh, for some reason, lobular carcinoma in situ, sometimes it likes to sort of um, circle around ducts, which is kind of interesting. Um, what else? Aha, yes. Uh, we talk about the uh, single uh, strand filing. Um, that's very common in lobular carcinoma where all these cells just kind of line up right uh, in a line. They kind of look like little snakes or um, earthworms going through the, the tissue. Okay, so this is just a comparison between a ductal carcinoma, invasive ductal carcinoma, invasive lobular carcinoma. Um, so, uh, Again, here we have our um, little circles, right? These are our ducts, and uh, they tend to be higher grade, right? They're invading, uh, as opposed to our uh, lobular, uh, invasive lobular carcinoma, which are small little nuclei. You may see some signet ring cells, um, and they're just single filing uh, through the um, stroma. There you go. Don't forget the donut. Inflammatory carcinoma is really a clinical diagnosis. Um, this is basically when um, tumor cells involve uh, the lymphatics and clog up the lymphatics of the breast, and uh, that causes an inflammatory reaction uh, that you see here. Uh, this is really associated with a very poor prognosis, and that's because the vast majority of these um, of patients who present with this clinical finding, most of them have metastatic disease at the time of presentation. This is the classic uh, 
peau d'orange or uh, basically the uh, changes to the skin that make it look a little bit like an orange. And that is uh, also um, associated with uh, involvement of the lymphatics by cancer. Okay, moving on to non-epithelial breast lesions. Our most uh, common uh, benign br lesion of the breast is actually the fibroadenoma. Okay, and here you can see it's this well-circumscribed little nodule here on mammography. And uh, this com commonly occurs in younger women. Um, can be multifocal uh, or bilateral. Most of the time it's not, though. And um, it's also a uh, hormonally responsive tumor, so these can uh, grow quite large during pregnancy. This is what it looks like grossly. You basically just have this well-circumscribed, kind of tan white, rubbery uh, nodule. And here's another uh, view of one. You can just see it's um, very well-circumscribed, very round, kind of rubbery, tan white in appearance. Very uh, mobile, too. This is what fibroadenoma looks like under the microscope. Um, you basically have biphasic growth, right? So you have um, glandular, so these are the glands that are left over of your T-terminal ductal lobular units. Um, and then you have a proliferation of the stroma. And what's happening is, um, you remember we talked about the intralobular um, stroma? Well, that is proliferating and it's causing uh, the epithelial components to get um, squished, and that's what's causing uh, this this look. But remember, the um, it's not really the epithelial component uh, that's proliferating in these lesions; it's the stromal component. Uh, the epithelial component is benign, still has luminal cells and myoepithelial cells, and uh, it's just getting compressed. Now, phyloides tumor uh, is similar to the fibroadenoma in that it arises from the intralobular stroma, but these patients tend to be older. Um, the important thing about phyloides tumors is, is that they uh, tend to uh, recur locally if they're not completely excised. And you can see that um, although like this one is very well circumscribed, uh, this one is invading uh, the fat uh, and invading um, the overlying skin, and that's something you would not see in a um, fibroadenoma. Um, as I said, these patients tend to be uh, a little older than patients who have fibroadenomas, um, and also you can see a hemorrhage and necrosis in these lesions, which you typically would not see in a fibroadenoma. Here we have the microscopic appearance of the phyloides tumor, and uh, these tumors have this beautiful uh, leaf-like architecture. Um, again, what's happening is the intralobular stroma is proliferating, and it's proliferating to such an extent that the epithelial component is getting completely pushed off to the outside and squished, and it creates these beautiful uh, leaf-like structures. Now, remember that these tumors are different from the fibroadenoma in that they tend to have infiltrative uh, borders. The um, stroma is very cellular. You will see mitoses. Um, nuclear pleomorphism, and uh, stromal overgrowth. Um, and if you're interested, this is what a ginkgo biloba leaf looks like, and this is a leather leaf. This is a closer histologic view of a phyloides tumor, and you can see that the stroma is much more cellular than compared to our uh, fiber adenoma. Um, so it's just much, much more blue. Again, here's our epithelial component that's getting um, squished and pushed to the outside. And you can see that this is uh, making kind of a leaf-like um, structure. Now, um, the stroma uh, can actually uh, have um, a lot of uh, atypia and mitoses, and it can be low-grade or high-grade. So this is a, a very low-grade um, phyloides tumor. Uh, but you can see how the stroma is still much more cellular than you would expect to see in a fibroadenoma, and it's condensing um, a, just underneath the epithelial um, component. So you can see how the stroma is kind of piling in just underneath it. And that's pretty classic of a phyloides tumor. This is a higher grade um, a phyloides tumor. Here's your epithelial component, and you can see all this stroma has gotten very dense. Uh, there's lots of mitoses that you can see that are coming in. Um, and so this is a higher grade phyloides tumor. And then this phyloides tumor, um, the atypia is, uh, is, is quite prominent. 
Uh, and matter of fact, this looks uh, more like a, a sarcoma. Now, as you can imagine, the higher grade uh, the phyloides tumor, the more likely it is to um, be able to metastasize. So that should about do it. We made it through. Um, that is your uh, basic breast uh, lecture. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to point out that in the background, secretly hiding throughout this entire lecture has been little terminal ductal lobular units. That's right, mind blown.